If you've ever been on a treadmill for more than 30 seconds, you've probably thought, wow, this is torture. And you would be 100% correct. That was literally why they were invented. Back in the early 1800s, British jails offered nothing but separation from society. Families were responsible for providing food and blankets for their imprisoned relatives. And as a result, bribing was rampant. As prisons were formed and started supplying you know, <laughs> basic living conditions. There was a fear that the poor would commit crimes just for a free pass. So how do you offset that? How about labor that was painful, pointless, and sometimes lethal? That's where the treadmill came in. Prisoners were tasked with treading on these mills for 10 mind-numbing hours a day. They would walk on these large wheels that would rotate and sometimes grind corn. Sometimes. Eventually, partitions were added to stop networking from happening because apparently, if you were a good lockpick, one of the best places to find a gig was on a treadmill. Try that the next time you're at Planet Fitness. After several years of use in more than half of British jails, a consensus came out that maybe, just maybe, making hardened men work for 10 hours a day isn't gonna make them reconsider their life choices. So the treadmill died, but after several years of dormancy, it came back. In 1952, some doctors in Washington started using it to diagnose heart and lung disease. Beyond that, William Staub read a book that told him, if you run a couple times a week, you become fit. And that inspired him to bring the machine into the house. Soon, his first model, the Pacemaster 600, hit markets and it became an instant hit. To this day, treadmill sales are still growing and projected to grow more. I don't believe that though. I know smart people are looking at graphs and whatever, but I look at Facebook Marketplace and it seems like literally no one wants one. But look at this one. At least it got used. Looks like it's being held together with super glue. Speaking of superglue, during World War II, the company Eastman Kodak tested all sorts of chemical for different uses in war. The team was trying to create clear plastic that could be used for precision marksman scopes. Before the war, the best quality optics came out of Germany, but thanks to circumstances, that wasn't an option. While trying to create scopes that were accurate and easy to make at scale, Harry Coover created a substance that would strongly stick to anything it touched, deeming it useless and probably getting really angry in the process, it was scrapped until nine years later when working on a different project, the polymer was rediscovered. He noted how the bonds were formed without the need of heat or pressure. And in 1958, Eastman 910, the product you know today as Superglue, hits the markets. This adhesive was a huge hit, being the go-to pot rebuilder, clothing vendor, and kitchen drawer fodder. The FDA even has approved it for certain medical uses. But one thing it won't fix is your broken heart. Super glue initially wasn't a wartime success. Its first aid properties became useful later, but a lot of everyday things are adaptations of wartime technologies. So here's the wartime technology speed run, because if we spent the money inventing it, God damn it, we're gonna use it. Thank World War II dehydration research for that Cheeto dust. Also World War II, Raytheon was, for some reason, trying to heat things from a long distance and learned that was really good for heating up food. This became the microwave. Internet, GPS, and walkie-talkies were really important for communicating distances longer than I can throw a baseball. Pre-packaged guacamole. Yep, the US government invented guacamole. Thanks Uncle Sam for improving my toast. Okay, not actually. It's high pressure processing, which is used to package the guac, which keeps it fresh. Not the guac itself. But speaking of fresh, when Listerine first hit the markets in 1880, it was sold as a jack of all trades product. The alcohol based germ destroyer was seen treating dandruff, dirty floors, and you guessed it, gonorrhea. Sometime in the 1920s, Listerine ads went from such a wide breadth to just one, a treatment for something called halitosis. Halitosis is a Latin term that translates into bad breath. And I'm not saying that Listerine invented bad breath, but for Listerine, halitosis translates into money and a disgusting amount of it. After the initial success of these bad breath ads, they doubled down. Paper ads showing dateless people, mostly women, just wishing they had gargled that minty lava. You'd think I had halitosis or something. X or exquisite. Often a bridesmaid, but never a bride. I could go on. And if you're bored after this, just Google search Listerine ads and you'll have a good 15 minutes of shock and awe. But I will leave you with this piece of advice. If there's someone from your past you just wish you could have back in your life, just use mouthwash, idiot. Back in his heart again. Now take a second, try and guess what the original use of Play-Doh was. If you don't know, 
Play-Doh is a modeling compound primarily used by children for arts and crafts. If you said it was originally used for cleaning coal off walls, you probably cheated. In the 1930s, a majority of American houses were heated using coal stoves. This method was very dirty and house interiors were often caked in coal dust. Play-Doh was rubbed against the walls to remove the soot, leaving your walls squeaky clean after World War II. Houses switched over to natural gas and as a result, the modeling clay was losing its purpose. Thanks to inspiration from a newspaper article, it was discovered that Play-Doh offered a much cleaner and safer way of allowing children to play with the clay-like material. After a formulation tweak and a rebrand, Play-Doh took the country by poorly molded, hard to understand what you're looking at unless you squint, storm. Since then, Play-Doh has sold more than 3 million cans, has been inducted into the Toy Hall of Fame, and even made its own perfume. The Play-Doh scent is so iconic, Hasbro even has a trademark on it, describing it as a unique scent formed through the combination of a sweet, slightly musky, vanilla-like fragrance with slight overtones of cherry and the natural smell of salted wheat-based dough. Mmm. Delicious. Wait, another fun fact about Play-Doh is it has three mascots. Play-Doh Pixie, Play-Doh Pete, and who can forget their current mascot, the Dodos. Not that one. Yeah.